uh, moving on to the final session for the day it's on the topic substance abuse in children and adolescents i request the chairperson of the session dr kailash sir to take over please sir yeah uh, good evening all so the last session of the day substance abuse in children and adolescents um so nowadays uh, the frequency and the percentage of people prevalence of people with substance abuse uh, has is gradually increasing so we have dr aditya kumar uh, singh um, pawar to speak about uh, this topic yeah dr aditya kumar singh pawar is a child and psychiatric fellow in massachusetts general hospital harvard school Uh, he did his MD psychiatry from Ames, Delhi, and he was a former senior resident in Ames, and also had worked in Ibas. He is a research officer uh, in All India Medical Sciences. He is a research scholar um, in Zafar Hillside Hospital. He was a resident in General uh, Psychiatry uh, Residency Training Program in Drexel University. Um, he has won many awards. He, um, he is uh, won the 2019 Psychiatry Residency Award uh, for excellence in teaching, and another uh, Psychiatry Residency Award for excellence in scholarly activity. In 2019, his poster had won the second prize. It, it was on long, uh, long-acting injectable antipsychotics in children and adolescents, uh, and he was uh, one of the finalists in ABA Mind Games, and he was the winner of Mind Games in um, on the Shukil uh, Philadelphia. so um yeah yeah uh, once in 2011 he has uh, uh, received the icmr financial grant um uh, for uh, <coughs> thesis dissertation it was a double blinded uh, um, randomized control study on injection pentazosin in opioid uh, dependent patients so we have a, a speaker here who's been uh, uh, in the field of substance abuse for a long time and his uh, recent research has uh, gradually moved to in children and currently he is a, uh, a fellow child and psychiatry fellow in harvard school so he has nine publications uh, in peer reviewed national and international journals and he has presented many oral papers he is the peer reviewer for nejm uh, the prestigious nejm journal and asian journal of psychiatry Uh, he is a resident fellow member of the APA and uh, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and American Academy of uh, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. So yeah, over to Dr. Pawar. I've stopped my sharing. Yeah, you can um, share your slide. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Dr. Aditya. Hi. Yeah, we are um, able to see you. All right. Okay. um thank you so much uh, dr kalash for your generous uh, like uh, introduction um the only thing i'll add again which uh, my wife already said is uh, my accomplishment that i am married to arya and uh, that's why she took the liberty to just uh, go into my time as well which i don't mind at all okay so i will start with the topic of the day which is Uh, and i'm the last speaker i do understand a lot of you might be feeling tired i will try to keep it uh, as brief as possible um so i will be talking about substance use disorders in children and adolescents when i start this topic i mean i absolutely understand a lot of you might have questions like is it even important in children and adolescents are there any ways to even handle it in, in children and adolescents and i mean primarily is it even present in that uh, don't we see like alcohol use and uh, any kind of substance use more so in 30s and 40s um, what are we talking about when we are talking about substance use in children and adolescents uh, these are the kind of questions which i have faced over the time and uh, this topic would try to address that to an extent uh, before starting i'd also add that uh, Well, how my interest in substance use particularly in children since came up was because uh, when i was working at aims in the national drug dependence treatment center ndtc uh, there 
we used to see kids having problems with substance use. And sometimes we even visited places where uh, they were in the surrounding where substance use was prevalent. Um, and there I started realizing that actually there is a lot of role of prevention as well as treatment uh, from an early stage uh, onwards. Coming to the USA, I was initially uh, interested more towards going towards substance use, but then again, I started realizing it's more of a developmental problem. Again, it's my opinion. Uh, I feel that when um, an adult is using substances, especially in the USA, it becomes so, so challenging that it's very hard to deal with. That's why I think it, it's, it's extremely important to start from early childhood or even adolescence to find out ways how to handle substance use from that level itself. Um, so I don't have any disclosures, uh, no conflicts of interest, which is just another way of saying that um, I don't earn any money from anywhere else other than my salary. Um, then the outline of my topic would be giving some historical perspective. Uh, I'll be going through some definitions and criteria. Uh, I have taken some um, liberty in digressing while talking about prevalence because I think there are certain things which are more important to talk about. And uh, yeah, so uh, feel free to interrupt me if you feel uh, like it doesn't make sense. Um, and that also happens if you're like making flights till the end of your uh, presentation. So um, pardon me for that. Uh, then I'll go ahead and talk about the etiology and neurobiology briefly and uh, the assessment and intervention in, uh, for substance use in children and adolescents. Do, substance use cannot go ahead without talking about the social or historical perspective. It's, it's there in the fabric of most of the societies, so much so in the US as well as in India. So you have to think about it in a historical perspective. Um, I'll say we can start with beyond, uh, before 1800 as well. Like before 1800, what we call uh, adolescents or youth today, they were pretty much treated as adults and uh, they were given all, all privileges. Um, they may use substances, uh, they may even use alcohol and nobody would bat an eye because they were also working and all that kind of things. With 19th century came the industrial revolution for the good. Um, the whole world started using scientific methods, technology came and there was increased emphasis on public education. Um, public education was seen as a way of building like a better individual over the period of time. So it starts from a child or from an adolescent. Thus, um, the Western world started denying adult privileges to youth. And uh, gradually there was a rise of temperance movement, which is basically trying to prohibit all the substance use. Um, though they would call it like a scientific temperance, it was more of a moral propaganda talking about religious stuff. Nevertheless, it did uh, help in decreasing substance use in children and adolescents during that time. In early 20, 1920s, there is some data which suggests that even around third of youth, 15 to 19 years of age, were being treated in some of the clinics in the USA for narcotic use. Narcotic would include many opiates as well as cannabis was included at that point of time. Um, in 1914, um, when they started realizing that the substance use is increasing, um, more so in adults as well as in adolescents, then came the Harrison Narcotic Act, also came the Marijuana Tax Act at that point of time. This act actually uh, placed some restrictions on prescription of narcotics. Then in 1930s and 33, there was a whole prohibition act. I mean, basically it started in 1930s. It was overturned in 1933. And you can understand the reason why, because they made alcohol illegal for those three years. I mean, that was a big uproar and it created a lot of problems. Um, so the prohibition act was overturned. Then in 1930s, US FDA was formed, I'm uh, sorry, US, Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which is now called the DEA. 
which regulates the sale purchase of drugs as well as defines what can be prescribed and what should be banned uh, which is very active nowadays and all of us are continuously monitored in various ways as to what we are prescribing how much we are prescribing um, and in 1940s and 70s actually alcohol and drug use um, amongst the adolescents kept on increasing despite these acts and everything however by 1970s if you recall I mean, of course, I wouldn't say recall. Basically, in 1974, the Surgeon General report came about uh, the cancer uh, happening due to cigarette use or uh, nicotine use after a lot of uh, opposition from the uh, nicotine industry. Um, that kind of report actually started helping in a way by decreasing the as uh, decreasing the use um, by increasing the perceived harmfulness, people started realizing, okay, there is a significant harm associated with some of the substances like nicotine. Um, however, this has gone up and down since then. And uh, you might be aware that in the US, there is a big issue going on about legalization of marijuana right now and whether that has an effect on perceived harmfulness of marijuana in youth is a question which remains and i'll talk about it later briefly i'll also bring up a little bit of indian history um back in my days at aims i had presented a seminar with uh, arya uh, where we talked about the indian concepts of substance use and if you look substance use again has been in the fabric of uh, like Indian population uh, at a very basic level uh, there are distilleries as early as 600 BC in areas like Takshila then I would fast forward they, there were several eras in between like Mughal era where again alcohol was used and Buddhists came who were actually prohibiting a lot of substance use while when British came actually they came with the they found a lot of revenue in liquor actually and this is true even till now most of the states uh, get a very good revenue due to liquor um, and there is there have been attempts to ban there have been attempts to increase sometimes um, these are the pictures which show how they advertised it then uh, it was uh, the Substance, was, substance use was seen as British wise at that point of time, meaning closer to 1947 when India became independent. And uh, Gandhi particularly uh, used it as a symbol of nationalism to an extent. And again, this whole talk is not about uh, the political aspects. Uh, however, we cannot go ahead, as I said, without talking about the social and political aspects of substance use we will stick to the medical ground just to get a background from where we are coming um, so um, substance use in india has started being seen as a major like nationalistic issue and they prohibited it uh, liquor sales and all that now, there was a lot of opposition from a lot of communities in india as well uh, specifically accusing this whole issue being elitist and that substance use helps revenue for a lot of tribes which use it very responsibly as well. Um, so with all that, what I mean to say is that throughout the history, there have been times when there has been a lot of liberalization versus prohibition as well. Uh, so now when the marijuana is being legalized, uh, the question definitely comes, what are the pros and cons? And I would not say that I have the answers to it. However, we are still finding out. Uh, I will talk about some definitions before starting. I do understand that uh, many of you are very well aware of it. Um, I assume there are some medical students or residents in the uh, um, in my audience as well. So um, some of the definitions which I'll talk about are what is substance use? I mean, in general, substance use would only mean using it once. And using it once might, once or twice might not be a problem as well. 
However, when you start misusing it, uh, then it becomes a slight problem that you are using it for purpose not intended medically. You are either diverting it, you are either using it in a higher amount. That's called misuse. Um, the biggest level of problem would be when you develop substance use disorders. So back in DSM-4, um, which is a manual for mental disorders, uh, basically substance use was divided as abuse and dependence. Uh, right now in DSM-5, they have clubbed all of these things together because the distinction was very difficult to make, um, saying that abuse was only maladaptive use while substance use disorder was associated with tolerance, withdrawal, and those kind of things. Um, very difficult to separate in a lot of people who are using multiple substances. So substance use disorders are defined as cognitive, behavioral, and physiological symptoms due to continued use of a substance despite significant substance use related problems. There are four facets which we need to understand in this definition as well as the criteria for substance use. There should be impaired control. There should be social impairment. The use should be risky. And there should be some pharmacological effect. Um, there are 11 criteria in total, which I will be talking about further. However, you only need two to three for a mild level of substance use, four to five for moderate, and six and above for severe. These are the 11 criteria. Again, in short, these can be classified in these four terms. Amongst the pharmacological ones uh, are in the end, which are tolerance and withdrawal. Rest, they can be like taking the substance in larger amount. There's a persistent desire. You are spending a lot of time on that. You continue using it despite having social, occupational, or recreational problems. And you are using it in physically hazardous situations like you are drunk driving. So all that is included in the criteria. The criteria to an extent, and it has been discussed in literature, does not do complete justice to adolescent substance use because it does, adolescents do not usually show withdrawals. I mean, they may show tolerance, uh, but rarely for substances like alcohol, they have either not used it for that period of time or generally they just don't show withdrawals. So they may miss those criteria there. There has been discussion whether these criteria should specifically involve some behaviors like when you are taking alcohol in larger amounts, you're binging and you get blackouts or you get into impulsive acts such as drunk driving or high risk sexual behavior associated with a lot of substances, including cannabis. So those should be probably included in diagnostic criteria, um, which I agree with. Then. Coming to the prevalence, until we know like how much is the prevalence of substance use we, in children and adolescents, um, there is little we can do uh, at a policy or a national level. Um, at the same time, getting prevalence of substance use has been known to be very difficult. Um, you can assume that most of the time what we do is take a survey. However, taking surveys has so many problems because if you are taking it at home, uh, then the kid might not feel a sense of privacy and might not even uh, respond correctly. While if you are taking it at school, they might over report it. Think about a kid who is 15 years of age and he sees some other kids bragging about substance use. He might actually start over reporting it as well. So the problem of over reporting and under reporting in surveys does create a lot of issue. What I would say about these surveys to take on is one, they are important. Um, without surveys, it's very hard to get any idea about the prevalence. Two, one must look at the trend rather than a specific substance use. Uh, trend is very important because it tells you whether it's increasing or decreasing. I will talk about uh, two of the surveys here. I'll not including YRBS. And I'll go into the full forms of these surveys. Uh, YRBS, uh, I did not include because it's a little older. It came in 2017, while the two big surveys, uh, NSGUH and Monitoring the Future, um, these are US surveys. Um, and latest one is in 2019, NSGUH was in 2018. I'll briefly touch upon the Indian surveys as well. 
So what is NSDUH? NSDUH is actually the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, uh, which provides up-to-date information on tobacco use, alcohol use, and drug use. Um, it also gives a lot of uh, details on mental health and other issues. It began in 1971. It covers all 50 states and roughly 65 to 70,000 people would be interviewed in this important study. Keep in mind, this is not only including children and adolescents. Uh, the number here mentioned as 16,800 is an approximation because they say 25% of this survey is allocated to adolescents. 12 to 17 years of age. So what did we find in NSDUH? Um, I'm sorry, I think uh, the font might be very small, but I'll go into, if you look at the whole population of adolescents, this blue area represents that. In that, the colored area as a whole represents the alcohol use in past month, uh, which is around 9%, sounds a very small number. And then um, yeah, amongst those 9%, only 3% use binge drinking. So you think, well, um, it's not a big problem. I think it's actually 3%, it's uh, mentioned as four in a separate uh, thing. So it's somewhere between three and four. But if you look at a particular number as to how many adolescents are using alcohol in the past month. So out of 24.4 million adolescents, 2.2 million would be using alcohol and more than half of them, like 1.2 million, would actually be using it in a binge drinking fashion, which is like a huge number. So what it means to say is that there is a huge number of population in adolescents using alcohol. Again, this is use, meaning they might be using it for once or twice. Um, I will go into alcohol use disorder as well. Um, the only saving grace is the percentage of people, percentage of kids 12 to 17 years of age who have been using alcohol has remained roughly constant. The number here is around 4 to 5 percent. Um, yeah, the number here is around 4 to 5 percent. And uh, that has roughly remained constant in last few years, which is a saving grace again. Um, to give a perspective, if there are 11 adolescents, um, then out of those 11, at least one would be using alcohol and more than half of them, meaning right, like one in 21 of these alcohol users would be binge drinking as well. Uh, 401,000 kids had used alcohol in a fashion which can be termed as alcohol use disorder as well. So it's again a very large number. Um, coming to marijuana use, um, in the same fashion when I said 1 in 11 are using alcohol, a higher number, 1 in 8 adolescents are using marijuana in the past year. And if you look at the number of alcohol use disorders, it's 401,000, while marijuana use disorder is an even higher number, 512,000. So marijuana use has been increasing, um, while the use of other substances has actually gone down to an extent, because as I talked in the history section, that there has been a lot of scientific advancement in rest of the substances and uh, not to say that there has not been in marijuana use, but um, because of increasing liberalization, probably there is increase in marijuana use in adolescents and children population. Uh, if you club marijuana use into illicit drug and club all the other drugs, then roughly 4.2 million, which is the highest number, 16.7% uh, of kids, adolescents would be using one or the other illicit drug. Um, which is uh, out of six adolescents in a class, uh, you will find one using illicit drug as well, which is a big cause of concern. Um, inhalant use here in the US is not that high, it's 2.7%. Um, and rest of the substances like heroin and cocaine are less than 1%. Um, nicotine used, if you see 
has gone down to 2.7% um, in 2018, which has gone down significantly from earlier. And again, the whole awareness about nicotine has brought it down to a good extent. Uh, why it remains at a certain level from last few years is a question we need to answer because there is a thought that some of these kids might be having things like depression, which actually are associated with nicotine use, as well as they may be having things like ADHD, which may also work as a self-medication, meaning nicotine may work as a self-medication for those kids and they might still be using it. So whether we should start treating them at a more rigorous level, that's something to address. Um, NSDUH also talks about perceived harm from different substances. And this chart on the side basically shows that the perceived harm for rest of the substances has remained roughly the same or as, has actually increased, meaning you are, the kid is percepting, perceiving this harm from alcohol and nicotine more now. However, with marijuana, it is actually declining. And the decline, this plus sign here shows that the decline has been significant from 40.6% people perceiving harm in 2015, it has come down to 35% roughly in 2018. So there is some evidence to show that perceived harm from marijuana use is declining. Going further about the prevalence, um, as I said, most of the time what we should look at is the trend. So in the past slides, what I have shown is alcohol, nicotine, a lot of these substances are actually decreasing, not to say they are not to be treated, but something which is coming up is marijuana use. Um, let's see what other survey says, like Monitoring the Future. Monitoring the Future is an annual survey where you go and talk to the kids in eighth, 10th or 12th grades. When I say kids, many times in the US, you can find adults or even many older people in uh, 12th grade. So the sample can actually um, include a lot of them as well, but we assume that a lot of them would be kids. Um, this survey is conducted uh, with the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan uh, under a grant from NIDA, which is National Institute on Drug Abuse and which is a very good source of uh, a lot of information on drug use. This has been conducted since 1975 and the survey has measured how teens report their drug, alcohol or cigarette use or their related attitudes in all three grades. Uh, in the year 2019 when it was published, around 42,000 students from 396 public and private schools uh, had participated in this survey. They um, do I hear a question? No, um, no Dr. Aditya, yeah, you can proceed. We have muted the person who was speaking in between. You can continue. All right, thank you. So, I mean, in the Monitoring the Future um, survey, basically alcohol use has shown a decline as it has shown in um, NSDUH. However, uh, you can see here the percentages are much higher. Um, there it was showing this 9% here in eighth grade is showing around 20% and in 12th grade, almost 50% people had used alcohol. Even the binge drinking was very high, 3.8% to 14.4%. Again, the sample size was slightly lower and it's on a focused population. So that's why the percentage might be higher. But what we need to look at is the trend that the alcohol use continues its decline, though it is at a significant level. Same with prescription drug use, like Vicodin and Oxycontin. Um, people might be aware that opiate use is a huge, huge problem in, uh, uh, in the US. And uh, a lot of drug use actually starts in adolescence. Um, earlier in 2009, if you see the percentages has spiked to 8.1% 8 .8 in 10th grade or 5.1% for Oxycontin. However, they have come down with a lot of awareness to around 1.1% or 1.7%. So there is a decline in the uh, prescription drug use as well. And when we talk about prescription drugs, we must talk about Adderall as well, because we see that uh, some of the kids might be diverting it as well. Um, 
I will be talking about it further as well because I have some opinions on it as too. However, if you see from 2014 to 2019, uh, in at least 10th or 12th grade, there has been a decline in the Adderall use, uh, Adderall diversion or misuse basically. While in the eighth grade, somehow younger kids have shown some increase from 1.3 to 2.5 percent. And we don't know the exact reasons for that, um, but that's what the survey says. In all, there is a decline in even the Adderall misuse. So what has increased actually? I mean, in monitoring the future survey, the illicit drug use, if you see, has actually declined overall. I mean, 11.5% are using it now. In 1997, it, ha it was much higher. Uh, what has not decreased and it's dropped, remained at least the same level is marijuana use. I mean, 35.7% of this past year illicit drug use is constituted by marijuana. So all the decrease which, is, which we are seeing is because of other substances decreasing, heroin, cocaine, LSD, they have decreased. But marijuana use, I mean, actually, it probably has even increased. We don't know. Um, the another problem which uh, has been associated with marijuana use is synthetic marijuana. We don't know what synthetic marijuana is actually. I mean, in the sense that anything can be called synthetic marijuana. There's no regulation for that. I mean, you may have K2, spice, and you just don't know what substances are being produced, designed, and they get into um, use, and they all are called synthetic marijuana. Um, the, if you look at daily marijuana use in lower grades, that has significantly increased, especially in 10th and 12th grade. There's slight decline in upper grades. Um, sorry, 8th and 10th grade, it has increased and slight decline in upper grades, that is 12th grade. Now, so overall, again, the trend is that marijuana use is actually increasing. How is it increasing in the terms of routes? Uh, people, I, people use uh, using it more by, or through smoking or other ways. That is an important consideration because many times it is touted that vaping is actually a safer mechanism of using marijuana or using any kind of cigarettes or anything, which is not true. I mean, um, you are using the same substances and because of that perception, probably there has been a significant increase in vaping. Daily marijuana vaping has increased to 3.5% in 2018 and 19. And this is the second largest one year jump ever tracked for any substance in 45 year survey. So people are vape, kids are vaping marijuana way more than before. Um, this vaping also is shown to have increased. If you think about, like I have talked about decreasing levels of uh, cigarette use uh, in past several years. However, this uh, marijuana use I mean, through vaping has increased. Cigarette use also, I mean, nicotine use also through vaping has actually increased. I mean, despite an overall decline in nicotine use, through vaping, it has increased. Again, we sometimes, and very, I would say frequently, do not know what kids are vaping. I mean, we, they might be actually vaping marijuana, which they are reporting as nicotine. They even do not know. So this vaping has increased significantly. So there is a huge question about what, I mean, what are we talking about marijuana? And if whenever you bring up with a kid, they will have a lot of questions. What happens? Uh, do we even get addicted to with marijuana? Um, what, why do young people use at all? And how many teens smoke? Roughly those kind of questions would keep on coming. Um, monitoring the future helps answer some of them. Um, I would also, mention a little bit about uh, the perception in India. Now, India, if you see, marijuana has been a customary, customary part of life in India from a very long time. This is a slide from one of my presentation in 2014 when I was at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences talking about Indian concepts of substance use. And we reviewed a lot of literature which shows that and you, you might see as well, it's, it's a fabric of uh, a lot of Indian population where marijuana use is pretty much used, I would say, as if 
it's extremely legal or something and uh, it's used for i mean it, on the holy we actually uh, use bang several times and so what i understand is when i am talking so much about marijuana there might be some questions in mind like as if it is an attack on the culture i would again try to emphasize that we are talking about the medical issues associated with marijuana and this is the marijuana which uh, right now is being sold in the us as well as in some parts of india, in some parts of india where um is not the same marijuana which comes from plants i mean again many people just do not know that the marijuana which is being sold most of the time in us is four times more potent uh, it has four times the content of thc which is the active ingredient of marijuana um and the same would go on in india i mean um, these western whatever is used in western countries does percolate uh, to india as well so it's a big question whether marijuana use should be i mean there should be checks and balances or there should be more awareness of marijuana use in india especially in children and rural sense uh, when asked i mean a lot of kids in U in the us say we use marijuana because everybody uses it um while if you see only about 1 in 14 teens actually say that they have used it in the survey so it's not that everybody is using it the other the argument which they will put is it's natural but natural doesn't mean safe i mean not all natural plants are good for you tobacco is natural it's not good um similarly they will question about if the states are legalizing it um why should it be a risk well risk is addiction and which happens with marijuana we all know and in 2016 4 million people have marijuana use disorder so it's also one of the most severe form which is of addiction seen in adults since research also shows that marijuana can harm the teen developing brain so big big question is legalization associated with increased use again we do not know i recently reviewed a lot of literature on uh, legalization uh, and we found around 56 papers who have addressed this issue and what my research says is that a large number of papers actually do show an increase at least an increase in initiation of marijuana use and maybe legalization is associated with that another question is how many teens are using synthetic marijuana 11% of high schoolers are using according to monitoring the future survey in 2012 and a lot of people i wouldn't say kids but a lot of people are present into the er because as i said synthetic marijuana is not a very specific term mentioning what is synthetic marijuana it can have anything in that i mean so a lot of people do present to ers and 75% of those were in the age group of 12 to 29 years um 14% were males and 8% were females uh talking about a little about the effects of marijuana use in cognitive and executive functioning which is important because many people think that it doesn't there is good amount of evidence to show that it does cause a lot of problems with making decisions remembering controlling emotions which puts you at risk of several other issues like you may engage in drunk driving you uh, or driving under influence or you may increase high risk sexual behaviors um so that's why marijuana becomes important if you talk neurologically uh recently there was a very important study which even shows that compared to any other substance the rates and predictors of conversion to schizophrenia or bipolar after you get a one episode of psychosis with marijuana or is much higher than any other substance is is whoopingly high like 47.4% compared to 15 to 20% in cocaine we all know cocaine causes paranoia and some amount of psychotic symptoms but conversion to schizophrenia or bipolar is not as high while cannabis where the psychosis symptoms are considered to be rare when they happen they would increase your chances of developing schizophrenia or bipolar disorder to almost 50% in a period of 3 to 4 years which is a whooping high number so we need to consider this 
Additionally, we have talked about e-cigarettes or vaping several times. And as I said, I do not consider it to be safe. And there is a literature to show that they can contain even potentially carcinogenic metals, other than the fact that we do not know what they are containing many times. Um, again, as I said, in prevalence, I would not be talking about YRBS, but uh, about some of the Indian surveys. Um, Initially, I thought there would be any Indian surveys because when, in, to, when I left India at that time, there was very little data. However, in 2019, actually, there was one big so I mean, this is a repeated survey which is conducted with the help of National Drug Dependence Treatment Center at AIMS, which found a significant use of inhalants in um, children and adolescents, like 1.1%. Um, did we have any other surveys? Yes, actually. And uh, recently only, I think in 2018, this uh, report came out, assessment of pattern, profile and correlates of substance use among children in India. This report included kids from schools, from street and provided a lot of data for the first time. And that was also conducted with, uh, in conjunction with uh, AIMS, Dr. Anju Dhawan, who is one of my, who was one of my supervisor, was one of the investigator here. Uh, this is conducted in conjunction with National Commission for Protection of Child Rights, NCPCR. So before going into that NCPCR survey, um, there are a lot of other surveys, smaller level surveys, which have conducted, which are conducted at a local level, and they have shown varying degrees of substance use in various parts. I would talk a little about Global Youth Tobacco Survey, which actually says that there is a 14.6% uh, tobacco use. I mean, I don't know how much we should be concerned about that, but there are other substances as well. Um, in the NCPCR survey, roughly around 4,000 people were involved, as I said, both school going and out of the school. We found a whooping high number of 70% people using alcohol. You see, 80, more than 80% people are using tobacco. Almost 70% kids are using alcohol out of this 4,000 population which is much higher than what Monitoring the Future also showed here. Um, cannabis is being used um, at a level of 30 to 45 percent. Inhalants and other things are used lesser. Uh, inhalants and cannabis are roughly at the same level. However, alcohol use is also very high in India. Interesting thing is there is injectable use as well. 12 percent of kids were also using injections, which is very concerning. What is interesting to note in this survey is that the mean age has actually uh, increased. Mean age of each substance is like 12.3 to 15.1, which shows a progression from gateway drugs, tobacco inhalants, to harder drugs like injectables at 15 years of age. Um, and if you ask them ever they received help for stopping, no, 70% of them roughly said that they did not. This is one of the survey which we me and Arya did um, basically reviewed uh, the data from NDDTC and we found out out of 142 people, a lot of people were using inhalants. Again, this is an older data. I would go by the newer data, which shows a lot of alcohol and harder drugs use as well in um, a lot of adolescents in India. Briefly talking about the etiology and neurobiology, um, so there are, there are a lot of factors, biological factors like genetics, environmental influences, family, religion, uh, which plays a role in either decreasing or increasing substance use, as well as psychiatric factors like if you have conduct disorder and ADHD, which are one of the most common associations. There's a gateway hypothesis which talks about substances like nicotine and marijuana, which when used early in adolescence, put you at risk of using harder and illicit substances as we saw in the NCPCR survey as well that uh, if younger ages were using lighter drugs so-called lighter drugs like tobacco and marijuana while as you grow older around 15 you are using high, very stronger even injections. Uh, it has been shown that early initiation of substances also increases the chances of marijuana dependence um, in around one eleventh of adults. Um, some of the risk factors like having early aggressive behavior, lack of parental supervision, substance use early, and 
drug availability as well as poverty are well known factors which increased marijuana use on the other high or sorry on substance use on the other hand protective factors like having more self control parental monitoring academic competence and anti drug use policies are strong help in decreasing marijuana uh, decreasing the substance use this is one of the circuit um, this is one of the paper which is talked about a lot uh, called kub and volko from kub and volko where they talk about the neurobiology of addiction and they gave one of the simplest of circuits as you can see i'll i mean i'm just joking this is very complex mm, i know there are stalwarts in this uh, forum or all like dr kalash and dr shabhi who can draw this circuit like out out of their head directly but i am one of the lower ones so for people like us i would just break it down into two things like the prefrontal cortex and the medial part of the brain nucle nucleus accumbens and ventral tegmental area in the midbrain uh, these are the major parts prefrontal cortex uh, is the thinking part of the brain while nucleus accumbens has the level of dopamine which when decreases to an extent motivates you to get more substance is the narcissistic king in your brain which actually makes you use more substances um prefrontal cortex is not fully formed in adolescents and that's why it's not the most thinking part, um, part in them and it actually does lesser inhibition a lot of drugs actually work either through increasing decreasing the inhibition or increasing the need for dopamine in nucleus accumbens Uh, I'll quickly talk about the assessment and intervention. I know uh, I'm getting slightly out of time. So uh, one of the major thing about assessment is one should, when you are dealing with adolescents, you aim for engagement and retention in treatment. Do not talk about a lot of research. Do not talk about a lot of uh, like what are the risks and problems. Talk about getting them engaged uh, at a primary care level. They should start talking about the. Uh, substance per se we know that at primary care many times we don't even talk about it utilize techniques like motivational inter interviewing keep a non judgmental approach inquire about each substance talk about positive negative consequences involve the whole family talk about what is the positive influence which the substance is having in what is the role substance is having in an adolescent's life um you may get a toxicology screen there's a screen called craft uh, which you can look up where for alcohol which talks about driving in a car or taking it alone or taking it with friends more than two score on craft actually puts you at a risk of alcohol disorder um there are a lot of preventive strategies uh, like school based programs but there is lesser data on that Uh, there is a lot of data on motivational interviewing cbt and things like uh, multi systemic therapy contingency management all these papers which i did want to go through but uh, I, due to lack of time i'm just rushing through that uh, i'll stick here where in the meta analysis they showed that involving family and in doing family therapy is actually helpful some of the psych psychopharmacological strategies for adolescents you can use alcohol for alcohol you can use like diselfram acamprosate naltrexone for nicotine you can use bupropion nrt a lot of these things are not fda approved for opiates methadone is fda approved for 80 years or less uh, if there are two documented failures while buprenorphine is fda approved up to 16 years of age there is a, some data to uh, show that buprenorphine has been effective naltrexone has shown some effect um, in nicotine users valerinicline has also been used one very important aspect which i do not want to miss before we close is adhd um there is good amount of data to show that if you don't treat adhd well there is a chance of increasing substance use over the period of time and in, in fact it puts people at risk so even if you are concerned about using stimulants in a kid who has increased risk of getting into substance use at least start treating first with bupropion or atomoxetine and there is not enough evidence to show that they start diverting stimulants though you may play caution but do sh make sure that you are treating the comorbidities like adhd adhd puts people at risk for substance use 
Uh, major depression is a well-known thing and in substance use, fluoxetin with CBT has the highest level of evidence. Some of the take-home points are substance use is prevalent in children and adolescents. Marijuana use is on the rise and is not harmless. Empathetic, non-judgmental approach is needed for engagement. Multimodal treatment involving the family and community is the key. Those psychosocial treatments in substance use are the mainstay, but you must treat comorbidity. And ADHD must be treated in a lot of kids because that puts a lot of kids on the track to substance use. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. Um, your cross-cultural exp uh, experience clearly reflected in the presentation and it was an east-west perspective of uh, substance abuse. Your experience in NDTC, NDTC Ghaziabad and uh, in Harvard Medical School uh, um, clearly resonated in your presentation uh, from explaining the history which came across in both the countries um, and also the problems of uh, the synthetic marijuana um, the difficulties of uh, making it uh, legalized and causing issues and the problems of vaping uh, and the use of inhalants, uh, increasing use of inhalants in our country uh, and the importance of engaging the children uh, in the therapy becoming the priority uh, in the management. So um, thanks a lot uh, Dr. Aditya for your lucid presentation. It was very informative uh, and we were able to connect with it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, can you um, just uh, stop sharing your screen? Uh, am I still sharing? I thought I'm not. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, stop. So, uh, we will, can we take a few questions now? Sure. I mean, uh, you can keep the yeah. time. I do have five to ten minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, a question from uh, Mr. Mustafa. He wants to know uh, what's the link between spirituality and substance use disorder? Can spirituality be used as a preventing model in substance use disorders? Again, um, <laughs> there is very, um, like, it's hard to say that there's no link between spirituality and substance use disorder. There is a good amount of link. In fact, uh, as I showed some, on some of the slides, like in India, many times, many spiritual people might be using substances as well. At the same time, cultures like Buddhism, if you are following that, or if you are following the teaching, they will actually prohibit it as well. So it can go either way, I will say. I mean, um, it depends on the context. Uh, a lot of spiritual people do use it. Yes, spirituality can be used to decrease it as well. Religious families, to an extent, do provide some protection as well. So you can connect it with spiritualism and you can think that that can actually decrease it. Hope that answers you. your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. One, of, one more question is about uh, how about the prevalence of multiple drug uses? So, um, yeah, I did not touch it uh, in the prep, uh, in the prevalence uh, part of my slides, but actually in adolescence, multiple substance use is the norm. I mean, it's not exception. Um, even in adults, a lot of multiple substance use is very high. All of these surveys actually uh, do not pinpoint like if a person is using different substances together, but we know from our clinical experience that most of the time when, I, when we are talking even about cannabis use or alcohol use, roughly the prevalence would be the same because an alcohol user is very likely to also use things like LSD, MDMA and all of that. So hope you can understand like in short the multiple substance use goes hand in hand with adolescent substance use all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a question from Niranjan. With legalization of recreational use of marijuana in most states in the US, do kids think it legitimizes its use and how difficult is it to reason with them, especially in a country like US where people have a more individualistic mindset? Very good question and uh, an excellent uh, thought behind it as well. Um, I did rush through some of the slides which were talking about marijuana legalization and as I said, I have actually been uh, reviewing this literature on recreational marijuana use uh, and what I've found is 
a lot of literature actually points out towards increase in marijuana use over the period of time in adolescents. Whether individualization or individualized culture has to do anything with it, I mean, it's very difficult to study again. So I would not say it is dependent on that. What it might be dependent on, and for sure is dependent on, is industry or market conflict. I mean, like in the, in the case of nicotine, there was a huge duties and uh, during these pandemic times uh, we have brought in two people from the same house um, mm -hmm. uh, husband and wife to share your knowledge with us uh, i know it's a tough task but still you people rocked our evening and it was an academic feast by the couple uh, so thanks a lot yeah both of you so we enjoyed the session um, we hope to see you soon thank you mm -hmm.